So today's workshop is hosted in collaboration with Open Box Science, and I'll give them a chance to introduce their project in just a second. Um, I, if you want to share how uh, you're doing today and with uh, an emoji uh, reaction that uh, can uh, that can show up on your uh, Zoom screen, you're welcome to do so just to get uh, to get started um, on this workshop today. I'm feeling pretty happy. It's sunny, and tomorrow I'm for Hawaii for two days. So can be happier and also happy to be with you all today. Uh, we are recording. Uh, we usually don't record these events, um, but uh, we thought that because uh, uh, the two-hour workshop is actually offered every quarter, uh, and it would be actually very good to have it on our um, YouTube channel for anyone who wants to go back to it. Uh, but what we are not going to record um, are the breakout rooms and the discussion. If we have, I think we have one um, uh, breakout uh, room discussion in the second part uh, where we come back and we do some kind of. Um, I'm actually not sure, but anyway, like any discussion that happens in the main room, we're going to pause recording. Um, and we have so many versions of this workshop that I lose track sometimes of exactly what we're deciding, but it's all in the slides and in the notes. Um, and we're not going to share the document where um, that you all have as available to take notes or not take notes, but um, it's, uh, it's available to you as a tool uh, for participation uh, in this call. And going. Um, introducing myself, uh, I'm Daniela Saderi. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the uh, executive director and um, co-founder of Pre-Review. Uh, I am a neuroscientist by training. Um, I came from Italy, where I was born and grew up, um, to Portland in the United States um, to pursue a PhD in neuroscience, and then halfway through decided that, um, or felt inspired to do something uh, different on the side. That is what pre-review uh, was at the beginning a site project that uh, then grew um, with um, together with Monica Granados and Sam Hindle. We um, uh, brought it to the organization that is today. Um, and I live in Portland um, with two uh, kids and my husband and two cats, I guess, as well. Vanessa? Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Vanessa. I am a community manager at pre-review. Um, I've worked in scholar communications for about the past 10 years, um, so I'm really fully engaged in this um, this space. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, my own academic background is in applied and professional ethics and philosophy, so it's a little bit different. Um, and I live in Oxford in the UK. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. And as I mentioned, uh, today's call is co-hosted with um, uh, Open Box Science. And I if I think there is a representative here um, of Box Science. And if you would like Open Box Science, if you would like to unmute and uh, share with us um, for a couple of minutes about your organization, and um, we, would, we would love that. Uh, sure, can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm Quan, and I'm a co-founder of Open Box Science here with the leadership team, uh, Jerry, Eugenio, and Anna. And we are a nonprofit started in COVID time where we make Zoom seminar of papers, talks available to people worldwide. And we particularly like to focus on early career scientists, first authors. And we think that this will provide great training and knowledge dissemination. What we really believe in is open science. And a lot of that, you know, have to do with preprints, which is what pre-review is doing a great effort on. And so in our open box science seminars, we already cover quite some preprints and we will likely continue in the future. And we hope that for these journal club, they are not just a one shot discussion, but these can continue on when we might provide reviews on um, pre-review for these preprints and have um, you know responsible peer review and trainings for everyone who's involved here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we are um, not going to talk about the platform until the end when we have a small tool, a small demo. Uh, but um, Open Box Science is one of our pre review clubs, one of the clubs. And so that means that it's a, uh, they get together and review preprints and then they get published on pre review.org. And uh, we'll see a little bit of that at the beginning, uh, at the end, sorry, of this uh, call. Um, but Oh man, I keep having trouble. Here we go. Uh, okay, so if you um, um, 
participation uh, rules. So, so we do have a code of conduct, a pre-review, and um, it is enforced um, in every event and every space that uh, pre-review is present at. And so we expect anyone uh, in this call to use a welcoming, inclusive language um, to provide feedback to one another that is constructive um, and being respectful, be respectful and welcoming of the, uh, different viewpoints and experiences. Um, and gracefully accept constructive criticism from others um, and showing empathy in general towards uh, other participants. If uh, you experience something that makes you uncomfortable and you suspect it may be a violation of code of conduct, even if you don't, just, uh, uh, you know, that in me, me, sorry, that needs immediate intervention, please don't hesitate to direct message us on Zoom using the Zoom chat, either me or Vanessa. Um, and if you experience um, a violation of code of conduct that doesn't require immediate intervention, you can file um, a report uh, by emailing us at report.preview.org, or you can fill out um, an incident report form that uh, has the option to remain anonymous. And Vanessa will put, I think they're already there in the, these links in the chat. I think we missed one slide as well, Danielle. Did I? Oh. That's right. Group agreements is an important one. So this workshop follows a uh, chat of house rules, um, which means that anything that is shared, especially this is true for the breakout, um, there is no recording that is shared by other participants. You're welcome to you know, ask for permission to reshare that experience, but we don't want attribution uh, to that participant uh, to be shared outside uh, of this, um, this group. And uh, please, please feel free to eat, stretch, move, step away as you need to. Um, this is completely, uh, you know, participation is optional and we hope that you just have a, a, a good time and participate as you most feel comfortable. If you need to ask questions, you can do that at any time. Um, you can uh, raise your hand um, and unmute yourself by invitation from by facilitators um, or typing in the chat. Um, and we already shared the link to these workshops notes. Again, um, this document will not be shared and it's just there to help interactions in this workshop. And um, if, especially in the breakout rooms, if you tend to be someone who is very comfortable talking, um, you can try to uh, make space for other people who may need more time before they feel comfortable doing so. And again, be curious and respectful of other opinions. And again, we have a code of conduct if there is Anything that happens um, during the call, please uh, let us know right away. Um, okay, so our primary goal today is to uh, facilitate um, a conversation and make space for collective learning that is most likely to lead to a transformative change in our practices. Of course, though, um, it is um, a, a test, a, I mean, it is a, a test of session. We only have two hours and we don't expect transformative change to happen that quickly, but we just hope that during this short session, uh, two hour session, we can um, just maybe uh, find some seeds and um, they can bring us closer to a more equitable and open scholarly evaluation ecosystem. And so my, my hope is that um, we can, um, after this, you know, together explore bias and system of oppression and how they manifest in peer review. And we can learn strategy to recognize, self-assess and address personal bias in the context of peer review. And we can learn um, who we are and, and what we do um, at peer review, just a little bit at the, at the end, as I said, with a demo. And go. If you wish to write any notes about this um, workshop, you can do that in the Google Doc or in your own, obviously, personal document. Here we go. Um, okay, just uh, one slide about pre-review. Um, we are um, an organization that operates as a nonprofit, peer fiscal sponsorship, um, and we our mission is to bring more openness and transparency and equity to the scholarly peer review process. And we do that by working around three, what we call three pillars. Um, so we design and develop open infrastructure for uh, anyone with an ORCID ID to uh, participate in open preference review. Uh, we lead the training such as this one um, and others in collaboration with uh, organizations and groups. Um, and we also uh, lead preprint reviews, collaborative preprint, preprint review together um, in calls such as this one. Um, and we really see the platform as the home for a community and a, and a culture change and community growth um, to, to thrive towards this future of um, more equitable and open space um, around scholarly evaluation. So, 
Okay, so workshop about peer review. Um, uh, we first uh, think first that there are many definitions of peer review, but we wanted to go with one. Uh, so peer review is defining the evaluation of work by one or more people with similar com uh, com competencies and um, as a producer of the work. And one thing that we really uh, think about at, at pre-review is this idea of like um, a peer reviewer as qualified members of a professor, profession who are um, asking us to, to review um, relevant work to their field. And so it's really interesting to think about what does that expertise and, and what, what does qualified members as experts Experts and what does and who does that? Who decides who disqualified uh, members of a profession are? Um, and those, I think, are a really important question to ask ourselves as we try to envision a model that is more open and transparent and more equitable for peer review. And peer review is often de depicted as a black box, uh, so this opaque process that uh, really uh, not many have access to knowing uh, um, how it works. And the opaqueness of the process is also what makes it so hard to evaluate objectively. Um, this is another uh, cartoon and depiction that is often associated and presented um, when uh, we're talking about peer review. And um, if you saw this cartoon and did not know much about peer review, um, I wonder, like, what would you deduce, right? What, what would you think? What do you think the artist was trying to communicate and capture um, in, uh, you know, kind of depicting peer review uh, in, in this way? So I wonder if you have any thoughts uh, to share in the chat. Um, I'm just gonna leave it a few a few seconds um, just for like immediate responses. So what what would you what does this image evoke um, in your in your mind um, about peer review? If you knew this was about peer review, and again, you're welcome to share in the chat. Yes, a hard process, difficult to lead your research. Uh, known to the scientific audience. Definitely doesn't seem like an easy thing to go through. No standards. That one is a new one to me. I like it. That peer review will be everything, will every, sorry, that peer review will everything to, do everything to stop you to publish. Yes, so there is just like, gatekeeping, which is very common. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And these are definitely like, you know, there is definitely, there is literally death at the end of this path, um, which I think kind of brings back to the idea of publish or perish that is often shared um, and felt by researchers. Um, and uh, this idea, you know, that there is a researcher unarmed that has to go through uh, this uh, tunnel of uh, armed uh, people ready to uh, to fight. And, uh, but the target is at the end, right? The publication that is accepted is what we are aiming. So we have to go through this, you know, meat grinding process. Um, and also there are other things that, you know, it looks like most of the uh, people involved in this process are from um, at least, you know, uh, same color skin, same ethnicity, you know, you can imagine. Uh, so it kind of like evokes to me also this idea that um, it's a process that is, really lacks a lot of diversity and it's pretty homogeneous with editors uh, being calculated to be um, or being reported to be like about 80% um, represented from researchers that live in the um, in the US or North America and Europe and uh, male and senior in their career. And um, so there's a lot that we can do to make peer review better. And one of the um, Things that I that we have pre-reviewed, but many others in this space um, see with hope, is that there are ways to open up peer review to the community, um, and to kind of remove this process from being only uh, gate gate kept by uh, journals and publishers. And so, uh, preprints uh, give that option. So what is a preprint? So a preprint is defined uh, by COPE um, as a form of publication that enables peer-reviewed peer, uh, peer articles to be disseminated quickly and widely. Um, and they have open access licenses um, in most cases, and they usually not uh, cost, cost nothing to the authors. Um, I think in most cases that I've seen, there is no cost associated with preprints. So I'm I'm curious to know why they use the word usually, but um, that is definitely the case for preprints. So they're often the author's final version of the manuscript and they're shared online free of charge. And 
the uh, this model of sharing and documenting your research is um, also a form of, of archiving that is uh, called green open access. And so we're going to see in the next slide how um, preprints can really um, help complement the journal's uh, peer review process. So in the traditional peer review process, you submit your manuscript to journal one, um, and then you may um, be lucky and get that uh, maybe positive or reviews that allow for going to the next step and revision and publication, or you may actually encounter reviewers that don't agree uh, with uh, whatever research you have, and they believe that it shouldn't be published in the journals, and then you go and do that again with journal number two, and maybe if you're really unlucky, you go to journal number three, but by the end that the published version is out, it might have been months to a year um, between that time of submission and the publication. And so in contrast, uh, preprint allow for, I'm having trouble with my mouth, um, for, authors to share uh, their research um, in the matter of hours. So most preprint servers will screen, um, will have a light screening process for your manuscript, but then the manuscript will be published on the preprint server, get a DOI, be citable, um, and um, something that we obviously care a lot about, allow for community feedback and ideas and discussions to, to be shared. So uh, obviously peer review is what we are trying to do here, um, uh, allow for open peer review of preprints, and then there are other pro uh, projects, um, uh, peer review comments, um, and other groups of peer community in that are doing uh, similar things and testing similar model. And Society um, is uh, a site where you can find a lot of these groups and, and um, how they're experimenting with preprint review. Um, really, preprints give a lot of um, have a lot of positive um, uh, associated with them. Obviously, we're biased because we really like preprints, and they allow you. Uh, you know, we already talked about timing, faster science dissemination. They have uh, open life, uh, open access licenses, so they um, can uh, be shared without the reader having to pay for them. Um, they um, do uh, act as productivity proof. So uh, funders do, um, in many cases, now they're going to require, like we know the Gates Foundation is going to do, but funders do look at uh, ACRA prints as proof of proof of productivity, which is really important for the recreate researchers in particular that are looking for jobs or career advancement so that they can prove that productivity without waiting months or years for the publisher to decide that it's time. Um, they do uh, allow for more collaborations. I think that it's a great opportunity to put your work out and get um, uh, people that are working in your field to reach out. And then obviously that feedback piece uh, that we talked about. And the scoop production is interesting. It's one of the biggest fear um, being scooped uh, that is associated with preprints, but it's also one of the reasons why preprints were actually started in the first place was to plant that flag and say, I've done this work and it's for everybody to see. So um, I, I, I put that scoop production as a positive. Um, okay, so one of the things that we talked about is um, that we would like, one of the things that is very dear to us, the peer review, is to think about how, um, you know, this process of peer review, it doesn't happen in the vacuum. It is happen, happens in the context of uh, human uh, behaviors and human history. And so what we're going to explore in the next couple of slides is um, how our uh, biases, or you can call them beliefs that humans hold, um, impact the process of peer review. And so before we do that, we need to define, um, and there are many definitions for every world, uh, word, but bias here is defined as a disproportionate way in favor of or against an idea or thing, and uh, usually in a way that is close-minded, prejudicial, or unfair. And there are many forms of bias that have many different people, many different names. Um, and we're not going to discuss all of the kind of bias in this uh, workshop. Um, here, this is just an example from X XKCD of um, um, a bias called. Um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, selection or sample bias, excuse me. And it's a speaker asking an audience of statisticians if they are familiar with selection bias to then conclude from the many hands up that yes, most people must know about selection bias, which obviously is ridiculous because it's a statistician conference. Um, so maybe you're familiar with that bias, but um, 
that are, again, um, many different kinds. And one thing that we would like to highlight uh, for the purpose of this workshop is the um, kind of distinction or nuanced distinction between what is often referred to as implicit bias um, as the prejudice that turns into an action that is unconscious. So we have a bias that is implicit. We're not aware of that bias, and therefore we're not aware of the impact of that bias in our actions, which is what we should focus on. Um, and that is often presented in a position to explicit bias, which is basically we are actually aware that we have that bias and we um, are aware of the, to a different degrees of the impact of that, of that um, bias in our action. And really the difference to me, the important to us, the importance between these two is not because in one case we can excuse ourselves. And in the other, we don't have excuses. I think that this is just a path to recognizing that we all have biases and we all have been uh, um, exposed to systemic uh, prejudice and bias that uh, affect us in one way or another. And so to me, the importance here, just figure out how we can bring the bias to um, a more explicit level so we can do something about it. And so in one of the um, things that we can start beginning and ask ourselves is where does bias come from? So um, are there uh, places in which we can we can kind of look at and say, okay, what are the what are the roots of these uh, of these biases? And so in the next slide, we have some examples of bias that may quote unquote hide in the peer review process. And so, for example, reputation bias. Um, the bias um, based on the race or ethnicity of, for example, the authors, uh, the gender, uh, primary language and writing styles, and how that is considered um, in the in the peer review as something that can be a proxy for quality. And we're going to explore more of these in a, in a moment. Uh, reputation of the author's institution, country of origin. Um, number of authors in a manuscript this is an interesting one because some community thinks that if you have many authors, that's a plus. Um, and if you have uh, other communities think that the fewer authors, the better. Like I was always encouraged to only publish with my PI as a PhD student and not have other co-authors so that I could show that I could do anything uh, or everything myself. And that always uh, was troubling to me because I like to collaborate. Um, but again, this is uh, it's interesting how the context of the community work and can, can look at this from different perspectives. And uh, many of the biases that we hold as people, consciously or unconsciously, um, have, um, and importantly, those whose impact really lead to the most harm, so that we want to be aware of, are rooted in systemic oppression. And system of oppression can be defined as discriminatory institutions, structures and norms and policies and practices embedded in our society that are used to oppress groups of people. And examples include racism, colonialism, patriarchy, ableism, cisgenderism, and this is just to name a few. And the reason why we bring this up is because we would like to um, start at least a conversation around how uh, some of these biases can um, kind of seeping into peer review and what can we do as individuals um, to um, bring them to light and kind of uh, in, in mitigate their impact. And so if we take racism, for example, um, we can look at how does, you know, a bias become systemic. Obviously, I don't know if you, we want to define racism as systemic uh, a bias, but you know, this is uh, just taking racism as an example. So systemic racism either deals with uh, who we are with ourselves and with each other, or how we build who we are into what we do. So when we look at this first category, we find two parts. So we have the personal interpersonal. And the term, like when we say like a personal racism, we are just trying to define to like what individual values and beliefs and thoughts that may lead us to have a prejudice in one way or another um, that may support this system of races. And interpersonal is just the express, expression of these beliefs between individuals that we interact to one another. And in fact, we've been socialized and typically explicitly thought that these are the only forms of racism that exist. However, more and more, we're becoming conscious about the fact that um, this is only part of the, the picture. And so the other part covers how we build 
who we are in what we do. So peer review, for example, is not just an entity that is up in the air by itself, but it's made all the processes are have people in them. And so the other two parts are institutional and structural. So uh, institutional racism deals with discriminatory treatment, policies and practicing within organizations, institutions that support uh, racism. And then structural takes that to an even bigger le level, which is just the whole impact of historical, cumulative and ongoing effects of um, a system in which public policy institutions. So like when all of that institutional um, uh, beliefs gets packed into policy and effect to live in a larger population. And all of these, you know, you can, as Dr. Antoinette Foster um, help us unpack when, when we're developing these materials, you can dub any system of oppression into this, um, into this framework. And they all have similar, very similar ingredients and they, all the components intersect with one another again, because it's not people are not un, um, separated from what policy um, is and they're interconnected. Did I? Okay. Um, so oppressive systemic oppression manifests in different ways depending on culture and regions and your environment, but it is universal and exists in wherever there are people. I've already said that. So the uh, science, thinking that science and um, and the practices around science are immune to this, is um, uh, not real. Uh, is a myth uh, that I think a lot of scientists, like including myself, have to work on kind of dismantling because that's what I was taught. And uh, in fact, science has contributed to legitimize its practices of oppression and discrimination um, for centuries. So we have many examples through history. Thanks. Thanks everyone for participating in the first half. So as Daniela said, our second half is going to focus a little bit more on some practical tips and some things that we can do to hopefully mitigate bias um, as it appears through through the um, peer review process. Um, we're going to use some of the things from our Open Reviewers Toolkit as part of this. Um, and one of these uh, tools is our Open um, Reviewer Guide. So we know that writing a manuscript review for the first time, it can be challenging. Um, and it's even more so uh, to do it objectively, constructively, and in a way that's really going to help the authors to improve their manuscript. So the review guide can be helpful to a student who's just starting out learning peer review, or also people who are more experienced um, looking to gain an additional perspective. It contains lots of editor's tips, content from the PLOS Peer Review Center, and it offers space to keep notes and keep track of progress. Um, and I think Daniela or uh, Chad will share hopefully the link in the chat for you. So the review guide breaks the process down into six steps. Um, the first step um, is to check your biases and assumptions. And we're going to do an exercise together uh, to go over this um, first step. Um, and these might be, for instance, related to gender or the country the author's institution is located, some of the examples that you discussed earlier. And most of us were certainly not taught to do this as part of the review process. And the other thing we focus on um, is also the importance of providing clear, constructive, um, actionable feedback. So outside of this generally being good practice, this is equally important when we consider the impact that destructive or unprofessional reviews can have on researchers, particularly those who are from marginalized communities. So, in the bias reflection guide, um, which we're also going to share a link to in the chat, there, this is a tool to guide readers through a non-judgmental thought process to self-reflect and evaluate your own biases and how they may impact how you conduct peer review. Um, and we call this the idea R2 method, and it has four stages. Uh, the first is to identify and evaluate the potential bias. The second is to add to it to make it less covert. covert sorry. Then we reverse it to try and think of deviations from this belief. And then we rephrase the original statement, adjusting it and in response to what we've learned going through this thought process. So usually by making time to just pause and think through our biases, we can usually find gaps in our knowledge that we may need to research further or simply find that our initial belief doesn't actually make sense. So we can try and update that, that way of thinking. And we're going to look at this with an example, which will hopefully make it a lot clearer for you. So we've got here an example of a, a biased statement. Um, so in this, we are reviewing a research manuscript and we recognize that the senior author is someone who's at a late stage of their career. 
And then we catch ourselves realizing that we hold the belief that because we know um, that they're at the late stage in their career, we think that they're likely to have a lot of domain ex expertise. And that knowing this makes us feel more confident in the quality of the proposed research. So if we dig into this a little bit deeper, we can ask ourselves why we might hold such a belief. So we can say, why do the author's years of experience lead me to believe that the anticipated results and the impact of the research are more trustworthy? So one answer might be that, I know this author is renowned in my field, so I think that they probably do good science. They wouldn't let bad science come from their lab, and therefore I think that this work is trustworthy. Secondly, we can move on to the second stage, which is to evaluate this belief. Um, so we can ask, is this logical? Is there a rationale that supports the notion that experience equals trust in the research? And we can say that their years of experience and them having gained the respect of the community may indicate that this study is likely good. Then we can add to this thought. So when I say add to it, we're going to add like a word here that makes it more of an absolute statement. So for example, is this always true, never true, this type of thing. So um, let's place always guarantee or never into the statement to see if it still makes sense with us. So the author is at a late stage of their career and therefore their experience means that their research is always trustworthy, accurate and reliable. So how does this now sit with you? So in most cases, making a statement so black and white will help us to reflect and realize that perhaps this is not always the case. This is actually a bias or an assumption that I'm jumping to. And then let's, it's sometimes useful to then reverse the statement. Um, so in this case, are there situations I can think of in which the years of experience would not influence the quality of the manuscript? So, the senior author may not have had time to revise the work, or this may be an unfamiliar technique, so they don't have the experience with how best to analyze this data. And finally, we can now rephrase our original statement, taking into account the reflection that we just made. So we can say that although the author's experience or recognition in the field may correlate with sound and rigorous experiments, data analysis and conclusions, it's not something I can take for granted. There are many factors that could influence a manuscript's need for revision. I should remember that experience does not necessarily mean that the work is not questionable or that it can be quicker at evaluating the rigor of the work. So I'm now going to move on to uh, step two of the reviewer guide, which is gaining a conceptual understanding. So this may seem obvious, uh, but what we recommend is that when you first read through the whole uh, the manuscript, the whole manuscript, you focus on understanding what the research is about, the hypothesis, the main question, the proposed approach, the initial claims and conclusions. Know anything that you're unfamiliar with, any questions that you may have, so you can come back to them later, but try to um, keep the thoughts of the evaluated thoughts and the judgmental thoughts um, at bay just while you try to understand the research and the initial approach um, itself. Um, so the goal during this step is to not look for flaws, but to try and just gain an understanding of the content. Um, so I'm curious to know how many people, how many of you uh, intentionally do this step before, or something similar, before you start to evaluate a research manuscript. So please put a thumbs up if you do do this. Not many thumbs up for this. Um, and then moving on to step three, this is then when we evaluate, appreciate and raise concerns. Um, so here on your second read through, you can then start to identify the positive aspects of the research, as well as any concerns that you may have about the project goals, the questions, the approach, methods, uh, the results, how the data is visualized, figures, tables, etc. And you can highlight these, write them down to help you organize your notes later. And you may have seen how sometimes concerns are presented either as a major or core concern or a minor or peripheral concern. Um, so major concerns are ones that the authors need to address before the manuscripts recommended for journal publication. And these are concerns that if left unaddressed could compromise the interpretation of the study. 
whereas minor concerns are those that the author should consider addressing to improve general readability and comprehension, but that if left unaddressed, they would not affect the overall interpretation of the study. So as with every categorization, uh, it's not perfect, it's not objective. However, thinking of your concerns in, under this lens can help you to structure your review and it can help the editor and the author understand best what are the concerns that you think are the most critical and will need most attention to be addressed in the revision. And here we've got some examples of what major concerns might be. Again, this is not like a, a, a whole list. These are just some examples. Um, they might be unethical approaches to research questions, um, conclusions that are not supported by the data, contradictory conclusions, not accounting for or an appropriate uh, discussion of study limitations or any com major confounding variables or issues with the experimental design, um, such as insufficient sample size or da improper data controls. And looking at some examples of what we may consider to be mi more minor concerns, um, these might be technical clarifications, um, how the data is presented or visualized, any typos, spelling, gram grammar and phrasing issues, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment, uh, or any missing or wrong uh, references or citations. Um, and we've got a little star there because just as we similarly said a second ago in our breakout rooms, while it may be tempting to focus on grammatical errors or sentence structure or choice of words, um, do remember that when you're reviewing, you're not a copy editor and poor spelling on grammar is not necessarily equal poor research. And this is particularly important uh, to keep in mind if you are reviewing a manuscript that's authored by researchers where English is not their first language, um, is this um, langu interpreting language mistakes as an overall an uh, indicator of quality is a common bias among reviewers. And moving on to step four. So on your second read through, you may begin to identify and take note of concerns that you have. Um, and But your review should not be a list of things that you believe is wrong. But as much as possible for each concern you raise, it should be associated with suggestions on how to improve it as much as possible and within your knowledge. So your feedback should be clear. Um, as, as it's more likely to be interpreted correctly if it is, constructive, as it's more likely then to be more well received, and importantly, constructive doesn't necessarily mean positive, we should need to be as critical as we need to be, but in a way that the reader understands why and is best positioned to address the concern, and finally, actionable, so it's more likely to be integrated um, and to improve the research. And again, actionable does not mean that you do not raise a concern unless you are able to provide the right answer. The action could be to consult with experts uh, in that particular field, and those experts um, need not be you. And we're going to look at an example of this uh, together. Um, so in this example, um, this is an example of some feedback that um, reviewers provided. So the author should go back to Statistics 101. Um, so needless to say, this feedback uh, isn't useful. It's destructive. It's even insulting. Um, and it's quite lazy. It's not It's not actionable. It's not clear. It's not con um, anything that they, it's not got anything that the authors can do with this piece of feedback to improve their work. So let's look at a better way in which we could convey the same concern. So using interpretation, reason, recommendations, and depersonalization, uh, we're going to reword this uh, bad feedback into something a lot more constructive. So the example starts with an interpretation um, of the concern. So the statistical text X is typically used for data that's distributed normally. So here we're going to say that the data presented in this manuscript appears to be highly skewed to the left. We then... Um, we also approach the feedback with humility, understanding that we may be wrong and the author's choice might be guided by a particular strategy, in which case we suggest that it gets explicitly discussed. And finally, we avoid calling out the author as the actor of the issue by depersonalizing our argument. And we use the statistical test or the choice um, of test as subjects in our sentences. So I'll let you read through that um, completely on your own. I won't read through it all word by word. Um, so, just to give a few more examples as well. So unconstructive and unprofessional feedback isn't just useless to the receiver, but it can also be harmful. And that harm can also be larger for individuals who belong to traditionally marginalized communities. Um, so here we have an example of a study where 
Um, a group of researchers conducted an international study targeting researchers in the field of science, technology, engineering, and maths, aimed at investigating the pervasiveness and author perceptions of long-term implications of receiving unprofessional peer reviews. And the types of unprofessional comments that people reported um, were things like this. So, for example, um, this paper is simply manure, or what the authors have done is an insult to science, or even more personal attacks, such as the author's status as a trans person has distorted uh, his view of sex beyond the biological reality. Well, the author's last name sounds Spanish. I didn't read the manuscript because I'm sure it's full of bad English. Um, so these are quite extreme um, examples, but they are real life examples. And the authors of the study found that traditionally underrepresented groups in STEM fields were most likely to perceive negative impacts on their own scientific aptitude, productivity and career advancement after receiving an unprofessional review. So it not only shows that unconstructive feedback is a reality in the space of scholarly evaluation, but it also underscores the importance of having training such as this geared towards understanding the impact of bias and systemic oppression in this context. Okay, moving on to the final steps in our reviewer guide. So step five is when you pull everything you've done so far together into a coherent narrative. So there's not one universal type of review format, um, but it'd be useful to have one in mind that you help guide the writing. This is a very simplified format that you could follow. So you might wanna structure your review like a bit of a, an inverted pyramid where the most important information is at the top. Uh, so this could be your overview of the research, uh, strengths and weaknesses, um, any recommended courses of action, um, followed by an examples and evidence in the middle, and any additional points that you have at the very bottom. And then finally, in step six, you check your review uh, before sharing it. So when you reread your review, take a high level lens, try and read it from the perspective of the reader and the author, not yourself as the reviewer, so as the person receiving the feedback. Thinking about step one, the beliefs and the assumptions you identified in yourself. How did you manage to do that in your review? Did you manage to keep those in mind and mitigate how they may affect your judgment? Thinking about step three, does your review highlight strengths as well as weaknesses? Step four, does the feedback sound constructive and is it as clear and actionable as it can be? And then finally, does your review read well from the summary to the end? Yeah, that is through the steps of the reviewer guide. So before we move on, and Chad is going to give a bit of a demo of the pre-review platform and just how it works authoring a review on our platform. Does anyone have any questions or comments generally about the reviewer guide or anything else that we've covered um, in today's session? In which case, I'm going to hand over to Chad, who's going to be a bit of an intro to himself, and then I'm going to stop sharing so that he's able to share, share his screen to go through a bit of a demo for you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, super excited to share a bit more of the preview platform with all of you. Hello, my name is Chad Sansing. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the product manager at Preview. Uh, I live on the traditional lands of the Monacan people, also known as Virginia in the United States, with my family and a dog named Sleepy who drives me a little bit nuts. Let's see. I think this is the window to share. Indeed, it is. Uh, so when you visit prereview.org, you will see a page just like this. There's one important distinction, though. I'm going to demo for you today on our sandbox site. This is our test site. Uh, it's open to the public. So if you're curious about what it's like to use prereview, you could visit sandbox.prereview.org first, try things out without worrying about actually publishing anything uh, and just get a feel for things before you dive into starting your own pre-reviews on prereview.org. So um, when you come to this page, I'm logged in. So this button at the top right says log out for you. It will say log in. You can click on this to register for the site as well. And all you need to create an account on prereview.org is an ORCID ID. Once you create an account, You'll get both a public profile with whatever name is associated with your ORCID ID, as well as a pseudonym, a pseudonymous profile that will be like a color plus an animal name. For example, uh, well, you should never share yours, but I'm on the product team and I do demos all the time. So I will tell you, as an example, my pseudonym is Yellow Hornet. 
And so when I publish pre-reviews, I can let people know that it's coming from me and I can connect it to my ORCID account as a peer review activity. Or, you know, for whatever reason, maybe I'm worried about um, professional retaliation or offending, you know, a researcher in my field who's known to be a little vindictive when they get, uh, you know, uh, honest feedback. I could use my pseudonym and no one else needs to know your pseudonym at all. Uh, we keep the pseudonyms secure in our database, but we don't ever go and kind of look at pseudonyms when people sign up. We only go when there's something having to do with our code of conduct and we need to check something out. Maybe somebody used a pseudonym to, to pen an attack piece or something like that. We'll go and we'll investigate further as we need to, but we don't use those pseudonyms for anything else either. Now, after you've logged in or registered with us, you can visit your My Details page, which is like a settings page for your profiles. Again, this is something only you will see. So I'm going to share mine with you as an example, since I work more in product than actually in publishing reviews. Uh, and you can see on this page, it lists my name, the ORCID ID that I registered with, and my pseudonym right at the top. Those pieces of information will always be there. And then I have some choices. There's a lot of control you have as a user on pre-review meant to keep you safe, secure, confident in your pre-review activities. So I can connect to my ORCID profile, in which case pre-review will share my pre-reviews, the published ones, with the peer review section of my ORCID profile. So you can get some recognition there for your peer review activity on pre-review.org. We've recently added the ability to add an avatar or an image, if you'd like, that you can take down at any time. You can connect your account on preview.org with your account on our community Slack if you want folks to be able to find you between both places. You don't have to. You can disconnect at any time. Um, your email address uh, you can change for when we might contact you uh, about opportunities, I don't know, uh, to learn about the newest features on pre-review. That's what we'll use. Uh, or if we need to contact you about a technical issue with a pre-review. Again, that's what we'll use right there. Then you can let people know if you are open for review requests. When they visit your profile on preview.org, they can see if you'd like to be contacted on Slack or not about reviewing something else. You can say yes to that. You can say no to that. And you can also change the visibility, so to speak. So you could share it only with other people who have preview accounts. You could share it publicly with everyone who visits our site or you could share it not at all. Same thing with your career stage, early, mid, or late. Same thing with your research interests. And you can type these in. There's not a set list that's going to limit you. You can put in whatever interests you. You can put your location in if you would like. And again, manage all of the visibility or who gets to access that information any way you would like. And you can share languages as well. Some of our clubs, which are collaborative review groups, are based around uh, language groups or affinities for reviewing in particular languages. And so that can help people find you as well and invite you to different opportunities to review in your preferred language on prereview.org. And then way back at the top of the page, once you have everything set up just the way you like, you can view your public profile as other people see it, just to double check it's the way you want it to be. So mine looks a little bit like this, you know, very similar. And you can see about halfway down the page, there's a notice that, yep, you can contact me. I'm happy to you know, take requests for reviews. And then you'll see a list of my pre-review activity. These are all kind of just example fake reviews. They're not real. They will not show up ever on prereview.org, but they're here so that you can see how your pre-review activity might be listed on your profile. Then perhaps not surprisingly, if I go to my pseudonymous profile so I can, you know, check out how that displays for other people. It's just going to be my pseudonym and the review activity that's connected with that pseudonym. Nothing else to identify you ever. Going back to pre-review for a moment, um, the main call to action here, of course, is to review a preprint. Though you can find more information up top. You can visit our blog for news. You can check out the clubs page to see if there's a group that's doing reviews together that you might like to join. Uh, but the main mechanism of action here on pre-review is review a preprint. And so when you click that button, the first thing it's going to ask you for is the DOI, the identifier of the preprint you'd like to review. And there's often a little bit of helper text in this workflow to help you better understand what we're talking about if it's not you know, clear or obvious from the start. Uh, you can always let us know that. We're always trying to improve the site, but the helper text is there for you as well. You may not know this, but in our Slack community, we've recently started a request to review channel 
We're using something called the Core Notify protocol and a pilot right now with BioArchive and Cielo, where their users can actually request reviews on our Slack channel from those preprint servers. But folks can also type in requests to this channel as well. And it looks a bit like this. Um, right now, we have these nice threaded requests where the first message gives us some keywords. So we can quickly scan to see if a review is appropriate or relevant for us. So this says, um, Timothy here is seeking pre-reviews for a preprint on working memory, inhibition, and brain network topology. If you're interested, see more below. And if you click on the replies to see more below, you get a bit more information. You get the actual name of the preprint and a link to it. You get a little bit of the abstract and you get an opportunity to start your preview pre-review right there in Slack. It'll take you right back to the site. Uh, I'm not going to click that button because I don't want to go to the real preview.org today, just the sandbox. So I'm going to visit the article itself. Here's the preprint loading now. I'm going to grab the DOI from the top of it. And it's just as simple as copying and pasting it. I'll come back. I'll paste it in there and I'll hit continue. There we go. I get a snippet of the abstract. This lets me make sure I have the right preprint that I want to review and I'm ready to start. I have three choices of how to start my pre-review. Uh, I can start a structured pre-review with prompts. This is great in like a learning environment because you'll get structured questions that model how to think through a review. You can also start with a template. It's a very lightweight template, just like the structure Vanessa just shared with you. Or if you choose the button for I've already written the review, maybe you've composed it in Google Doc or an Etherpad or something, you can just copy and paste it right in. I'm going to show you the structure review today uh, because it also has text boxes in it. So you can see how you can add comments in addition to um, choosing your responses uh, and adding your review to a text box is the same exact thing if you work with the template or you've already written the review. So let's try it out. We'll click on with prompts, we'll hit continue. And you can see now I'm gonna be guided through a series of questions. So the first one is, you know, does the introduction explain the objective of the research presented in the preprint? Uh, I'm gonna say yes. And I'm gonna say there's a thorough explanation. So once you choose yes, partly, no, I don't know, you'll get a text box where you can offer more specific and constructive feedback if you have it. I'll save and continue. And I can go right through each question. I don't have to leave additional comments, but I always can. So this is just an example review. So I'm just gonna click highly appropriate and clear for most of these answers, take us through these questions, and then show you the last few stages of publishing your pre-review. So here we go, here's a question. Would it benefit from language editing? You can say no, there might be some minor issues, but there's nothing in the way of uh, clarity or understanding. Or you could say, yes, there, there might be some errors or something here that um, it would be helpful to fix just in terms of the language. And again, you get this box here. So you could say something like a few of the sentences have awkward structures. Like in, I don't know, paragraph five of page two. And then you could even provide an example sentence if you wanted to. So again, not a lot of judgment here, just a little bit of, uh, is there anything getting in the way of understanding? If not, great. If so, give an example of something that might be fixable. We can continue. Would you recommend the preprint to others? Yes, it's of high quality. Yeah, it needs a little bit of improvement. Or no, not yet. Is it ready for attention from an editor, a publisher, a broader audience? Is this something that you feel is ready to advance in the scholarly communications pipeline? You can say, sure, as it is. You could say yes after some changes, or you could say, you know, no, not yet. It needs revisions. Then you get to choose which name you'd like to use. You can use your public profile or your pseudonymous profile. Again, if you'd like a little more privacy and security, just because of the nature of your feedback, perhaps, or um, the recipient. But I'll go ahead and publish this under my name. Did I review this preprint with anyone else? Uh, you can say, no, I reviewed it alone. Yes, but they don't want to be listed or yes, and they all would like to be listed. And I'll click on that because recently we've added a uh, multiple authors workflow to this publication uh, process here. Um, you do have to assert that the folks you've written it with have read and approved the pre-review for us. And then you can go ahead and add their names. So I could add myself at another, you know, at my personal email, let's say. And what this will do 
is it will prompt pre-review to send the people that you list an email asking them to confirm their participation and again to let us know if they'd like to be listed with their public id or their student so again safety all around we'll hit save and continue um, there's an option to add another author five authors six authors however many authors i'll say no no other authors we'll continue we have a uh, window here for competing interests. So for example, if you authored the preprint, probably don't wanna publish your own review of it, uh, but maybe some of these other pieces here in this helper text come up. Maybe you collaborate with the author, uh, you're a rival or a competitor of the author. I'm gonna say no. Uh, just please note that it is part of our code of conduct that if you have a competing interest, you declare it here. Save and continue. Uh, we also ask you to assert one more time with some examples of expected behaviors and prohibited behaviors that you're following the code of conduct in your pre-review. If you assert that you are, the process can continue. And then you get an opportunity here to check everything over before you publish. So you could change your name back to your pseudonym or from your pseudonym back to your public name. If you say, oh, maybe that is a competing interest, you can go back and list it. You can change any of your answers. You can go back and edit uh, any of your text. And when you're all ready, when everything is the way you want it to be, you click publish your pre-review and there it is. It will get its own DOI from Zenodo. It will be displayed on Zenodo. It will be displayed on pre-review.org. And then there's a couple of little pointers here about what happens next. Um, some places you might share your review on Society, LinkedIn, Twitter. And then there's a link to schedule an interview with me if you'd like to give feedback about the process. We love to do user research interviews. We love to keep making things better and better. So if ever you have you know, some feedback for us about how we could change this, how we could make it work better for you, please don't hesitate to schedule a time to talk with me. And uh, I would love to know what you think of pre-review.org. Now, on Sandbox, this doesn't actually happen. So this pre-review will be listed on my Sandbox profile, but it will not go to Zenodo. It will not ever be listed on preview.org. So again, if you're at all nervous about using preview, you'd like to try some things out, Sandbox is the place for you so that when you're ready, you can publish and get recognition for your peer review activity on preview.org and your ORCID profile. I probably went over, so I'm going to stop there. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Chad. It's a really thorough, excellent overview. Are there any questions before we, we wrap up today about the platform? Yeah, so, so I have a question. Uh, thank you very much, Chad and Daniela and Vanessa as well. So I every time I, for example, I write, I write a, a pre-review and I, I upload it to the platform, does the authors get any notification that I I did uh, a pre review on their on their manuscript. Not yet, but that same core notify protocol that we use to kind of funnel requests from BioArchive and CLO to our um, our Slack community. Uh, one of the pieces of work we'd like to do a little bit later on in our roadmap is to figure out when those requested pre reviews are complete. How do we then ping back the authors to let them know someone has responded? So. Our next step, we'll be looking at how we can do that with our existing core notify integrations. And then in the future, that's, you know, that's something that we would like to uh, continue looking at how we might be able to automate that. But since not every author is necessarily making a request or a member of pre-review, we just don't have like a 100% certain way to contact them yet, though we encourage, you know, um, reviewers or others who might request reviews, such as editors, to let authors know if they see something that's been uh, pre-reviewed on our site that, that they wrote. And, and just like uh, my second question would be like, uh, thinking about the promotion of, of, of the, the pre-review, do mm -hmm. you like, if I, I, I cry, uh, one second, if I upload a pre-review, do you mm -hmm. like automatically put it on pre-review social network that someone did, this preview of that given paper? 
We do not since uh, it's, you know, we do not have a mechanism for knowing if the reviewers would like us to do that or if the authors would like us to do that or if they would like it to be, you know, a little um, maybe in a more closed circle of feedback. However, we are working on a share review channel in our Slack community where we do anticipate letting people know when reviews have been published since that is a community comprised entirely of pre-review users and it's kind of a, a good pool of folks to notify about that smaller pool, but doesn't necessarily broadcast it across, uh, you know, bigger social media channels in case people don't want it to be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Chad, um, for this very thorough um, demo. And we'll probably publish also that as a separate uh, demo on our YouTube channel. So for other people, but every week we have updates on our platform. So our demos get out of date <laughs> very quickly. Um, so thank you so much for participating and for sitting through the two hours. And uh, we hope you join the community. I think maybe there is um, a few things in the chat. If you want to join links, join um, uh, to join our Slack channel, um, our newsletter, if you wish to. And we would love to, again, thank you, Open uh, Science Box, for uh, joining and co-hosting today. Uh, oh, here, Vanessa has uh, a few next steps um, that could be done uh, if you would like to participate and uh, in, in any pre-review activity. But thank you for being here today. Yeah, so just a couple of uh, things just to say to wrap up. These are some of the things you can go on to do next. Um, I know people are folks from Open Box Science are already here, so they've already obviously started the pre-review club. Um, but there might be some people on the call who wish to join one, um, set up their own, um, that you can also organize a uh, review training for your organization. Uh, we will obviously put news when we have future community workshops up as well. Um, do join our Slack community. Um, that's where we post lots of our things and where you can also share your own reviews, post any review requests, this type of thing. We have a bi-monthly newsletter. Um, so I believe the link to these have already been shared in the chat. So thank you very much for joining, for sharing that. And we also run live reviews. So this is where we bring groups of viewers together um, to on Zoom to re review a preprint together. So we guide people through a series of questions similar to the ones that um, Chad showed in the demo. Um, and then we sort of gather all of the notes together to publish a collaborative review. And we do these fairly regularly, usually once a month. And our next one is this Friday. So if you're interested in joining that, please uh, feel free to sign up. Okay. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you again to Open Box Science for um, um, requesting this workshop and, and allowing us to also open up to the wider community. So we hope that you found this useful and uh, we're happy to answer any questions. I'll stay online for a few more minutes in case there are any other questions and you can always contact us um, at community at preview.org or reach out to us on Slack. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks all.